I appreciate everybody coming today for this live event. I think this is going to be an interesting topic for us to uh, go through and kind of learn a little bit about and some planning we can do in the future. So as soon as this idea kind of came around, I was like, yes, this is definitely something we need to bring to the group and at least have a discussion about. Luckily, this conversation was uh, spurred by my guest here, Link Mosier, who I actually received a letter from in the mail, like a physical letter in the mail, uh, talking about how he acquires agencies. Uh, and that sparked my interest in uh, in exactly how that works and I wanted to learn more about it so I connected with link we talked a little bit and I asked him to join us here today so uh, first off good morning and hello link how are you doing today I'm great it's nice to be here Kyle appreciate it yes absolutely we're happy to have you here and and just so I don't forget at the end in case I do thank you so much for being willing to come on here and, and share your experience doing this as I know this is gonna help a ton of people there's lots of people excited about hearing it so I appreciate you being willing to do this my pleasure. Awesome. So to get us started, why don't you tell us a little bit of uh, background on yourself, what exactly it is you do, and how long you've been acquiring agencies? Sure. So I, uh, I got started in web development in 1996. I was just a few years out of high school. I remember, uh, you know, we, we were using Prodigy, you know, which is like an AOL uh, sure. service back in the 90s. And I remember when the World Wide Web came out, they gave us five hours a month to use the web. And I, my brother and I, you know, it was just dial up and, uh, but you know, five hours, boy, I, I probably use more than that in a day now easily. And, but there wasn't much out there, you know, and it was slow. So it's like, where are we going with this? But I remember somebody told me, I think it was my dad that says, why don't you build websites? And I had, I had no idea how to do that. And, uh, I went down to the bookstore, I had to get in the car, actually drive there because there was no Amazon, no prime and, and buy a book on HTML. And I, I'd always been into computers and then taught myself uh, HTML. All right, this, this is, you know, it's markup language. It, it was not too complex. And so, you know, that that's, was a start. And I started building websites, freelance, uh, taught myself SEO, um, you know, learned WordPress and CMSs. And, and just, you know, the, as you, as everyone knows, it's completely continues to evolve. And I would say probably somewhere you know, in the late 2000s, probably 10, 15 years into my, my career here, I learned about one of my, you know, friendly competitors that had just recently transitioned all their clients over to another agency here in, in the state. And, and th you know, they were sort of, again, I used definitely a very friendly competitor because we were friendly, but we were very similar in types of the projects that we would be up against. And, I remember vividly that they did not reach out to me. I did not have an opportunity to be at that table for whatever reason. Maybe they didn't know I would have been interested. Maybe they just had a stronger connection with another firm. Maybe it was a, I believe it was a, a life-changing situation where there may have been a, a marriage that was going down and and a, and a, a, an auto accident that caused an injury. It was a husband and wife team. So it was you know, definitely a, probably an unplanned occurrence, but those kind of things can happen to any of us. And it made me think that I needed to get ahead of this a little more if I ever had an interest in acquiring a firm and just, just have a chance to have the conversation. So I started sending out letters just like the ones I still send today, like the one you saw. Um, you know, a lot of people do email uh, and I'll, I'll follow up with email, but I still like the old school, you know, sit there, I hand sign it, I put the stamp on, it's a, it's a grind and, you know, you, I've got a, this old inkjet printer that prints on envelopes, which, you know, every time you go to do a batch, you've got to run the printhead cycles because it clogs up. And it's, so it's a, it's a process. And, uh, but I feel like sending the letters, I've got a virtual assistant that helps me locate the names and addresses. And I, I kind of go state by state. And then I use old school Excel to put all that in there and keep my notes about who I talk to. And, and, um, you know, it, it's a needle in the haystack process, but I have probably acquired uh, a good five or six over the years. Um, they come in spurts, uh, but many of those have been very good growth blocks for my business. When it was a good fit for me and a good fit for the person selling, they're hands down best investments I've, I've done. Now, we'll get into this later, but there's definitely some challenges and growing pains with that too. So don't don't let me suggest it's uh, 
a cakewalk by any means. Yeah, I'm sure. And and I will say, had your message come to me via email, there's no chance I would have even opened it past the subject line, much less gotten through all of it. But the fact that I drove to my post office, had a letter from somebody I didn't recognize, you know, I opened it up, read it, and then it turns into something like this. So that's probably, I think you're on the right track. Not that you needed my uh, no, approval no, on that, but I think you're on the right track. Did you uh, did you just reach out right away? I'm curious. Or did you Google me? I mean, I my hope is people will, all right, this guy's got a letterhead. Let me go to his website. Let me look him up on LinkedIn. Uh, did you do any of that? Or yeah, just, yeah, I, okay. I did all of that. I, in fact, I, I called uh, my partner here in the admin bar uh, because he actually lives not too far from you. So I asked him first if he had heard heard of your business name or anything like that uh, and read him the letter. Uh, and I came back and Googled you and, and shared it with some of my friends here at the admin bar. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to... I, I'm, I have no reason to sell my agency right now. I'm not sure that my agency is necessarily sellable, but I'm like, well, I want to find out more about this, you know, out of the curiosity for myself. And as we curate content for this community, uh, I thought this would be a really good thing for me to, uh, you know, talk about, bring up in the group and hopefully eventually be able to talk with you about it, uh, which all that worked out. You know, I, I ended up giving you a call and you called me back and, and here we are. So yeah, Great. I definitely, I did my little research on that before Good. to make that's, sure. That's what I hope people do. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't know it, there's so many scammers out there these days, but yes. I, I got an idea pretty quick that you were a real human being. So that definitely helped out. But yeah, so I think, um, I guess to start this out, I think a lot of us started our journey. I've heard a lot of people in this group tell me about how they get started in web design and the stories are almost all similar to what you just described, you know, uh, maybe not going back to uh, the date you started, but somebody took an interest in this, uh, started as kind of a side project or something fun to do. Uh, quickly, you know, a friend asks you, a family member asks you, next thing you know, you're selling websites and then you realize, hey, I'm actually making money doing this or, you know, maybe I could leave my job and do this full time and you kind of evolve into this almost accidental business sometimes. I would say most people uh, end up doing this almost accidentally rather than making a five-year plan and in year three, I'm going to launch a web design agency, you know? So it, it happens organically for a lot of us. And probably one of the downsides to that um, is that you're not thinking this as a business venture necessarily from the start. So you might not be thinking about the life cycle, the business, the beginning, the growth, the middle, the end, and especially that end part, like where does this stop? Um, so I think one of the reasons this is so interesting is, is the idea of planning that exit strategy. So I'm curious to know, kind of to start this out, with the experience you've had, why are some people um, deciding to sell their agencies? What what situations bring that uh, bring that on? Excellent question, and that's probably the first question that I ask people because I want to hear a a good answer to that one. Because if it's strictly financial, that's probably not the right answer. I'm probably not the right buyer for that. The cases where it has been a good fit. Uh, one gentleman was retiring. It had been a second career for him. So he had had a, a corporate career and he was uh, in a retirement age um, and had just probably done this like you just described, did a few of them, something to do, you know, kind of in those early years of retirement. And then, you know, had a little book of business and just was ready to be done with it. And uh, he had actually had a, a false step trying to find another company and and so my timing was very good because he was actively looking for someone to uh, place his client list with. Another gentleman was spinning out some clients. He was taking his agency in a different focus. So as many of us start out being kind of the generalist, we mm -hmm. take the business wherever we can get it. And then sometimes we get traction in a particular vertical or a niche that, that resonates with us, either because it's very profitable, we really like it, or we see opportunity in it. And that was the case for him. He was taking his agency to focus on municipal web projects. And so he had about a hundred clients that did not fit that, that he was looking to uh, you know, offload. Uh, another fellow was changing careers. So he was leaving the industry, going into a, a totally unrelated industry. Um, and then another one was more on the graphic design thing. He did not care for the hosting side. And so was looking to offload that piece so there's a lot of different reasons it's not necessarily i'm selling my entire company it may be that i no longer want to provide a bucket of services i may no longer want to service a bunch of unrelated industries 
uh, you know, those are all fine reasons. Um, you know, the conversation that you don't really enjoy having is the one who says, well, you know, I want, uh, you know, a million dollars or, you know, I, I want 10 times revenue. Um, you know, I want it all up front. I mean, it, if it's strictly money, then it doesn't make sense for me. Maybe somebody is out there that would, but you know, the motivation, the reason for it, you know, burnout is a good one. I mean, that, that's valid. And, and, you know, this, you know, for me being in this industry 25 years and thinking someone else may have done that and been older, they may be approaching, you know, retirement age is a very good one because none of us can stop the clock. Sure. But it is a younger industry, so you have more likely to find younger people in this industry than you would plumber, electrician, car repair. I mean, uh, older, more I don't want to say this is not an established industry, but sure. um, plumbers have been around a little longer. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, th I think that's interesting to think about, too, because the first thing you might think is kind of like that into career status. But just the idea of, hey, you know, I've niched down into a certain industry and now these clients that were once great to have are kind of a drain on my time. Uh, obviously, just cutting them loose and, and cutting your losses isn't the best thing for your client or for yourself. So being able to find somebody to, you know, effectively sell those clients to is probably a good win-win uh, for, for both sides it of the is. party. It is. And the, the other scenario is uh, agencies, as they get lower, they may level up in terms of client size. Mm -hmm. So you may be doing larger projects. Your, your overhead may increase as you bring on staff and uh, other expenses where smaller clients may not be as profitable. And, and I've taken over accounts for larger agencies that, you know, have, have some of these uh, clients that just have not grown with the agency and uh, maybe not, uh, again, it may be tied to services or it may just be, you know, these are too small for us to really, it's not worth the time, yeah. but we still care about them and want to make sure they are taken care of. So depending on where you are at and your specialty, there are bound to be people out there that you know, maybe looking to place people with, and, and those are great conversations to have. Yeah. Or, or as somebody in the comments just uh, pointed out, somebody's going, uh, <laughs> a client demands the logo be bigger. So you just quit and call link. <laughs> that could be another reason. <laughs> well, personalities can be, you know, I've got one client now that came from another agency that he, he just felt he was losing them and they're, they're a great client. One of my favorite clients. So it was just, yeah. Either his heart wasn't in it or he was going in a different direction and, and or just wasn't compatible with them. And yeah. he, he saw that and wanted to, you know, and so I'm happy to help them. And so, yeah, I wouldn't say send all your nightmare clients my way, <laughs> but uh, there's definitely conversations that you can have. And, and again, as many of us know, these are very personal relationship type businesses. And so sometimes our personalities are just not a fit. I, yeah. I have wanted to have people to refer things to when you know a client just is not a fit for me we are not getting along for whatever reason doesn't make them bad it's just i need to get rid of them because i'm go nuts you know and maybe they are too right so yeah, we can all we can all relate to that we've all been there for sure so um I guess one of the important things to know uh, as we think about how this might play out in our own agency or as a buyer, what are the things when you when you have your VA sourcing agencies, uh, when you have that conversation with agencies and as maybe those conversations progress and you start digging into uh, more details about the agency, what are some of the things that make an agency an attractive buy? So we might be talking about the size of the agency, like as in a bunch of team members or no team members or their client list, how big that is, their total revenue, their recurring revenue. What are like the big factors that, that come into that? Sure, sure. And there's a lot of them. Um, and, and I'll preface that by saying, you know, every buyer's appetite is going to be a bit different. Uh, I, I'll speak generally and I'll speak a little, I think for, for me, you know, I'm, I'm kind of interested in the much smaller deal size, 20 to maybe 200 clients. Um, I like recurring revenue that comes from services like web hosting, email domain management, uh, as well as a mix of project-based work, typically web design, WordPress is our, our, you know, platform of choice. So when I see something that is very similar to where I am, you know, that, that for me, isn't the only thing I would be interested in, but it's very good compatible fit because I know I can support that. 
Um, but certainly there are going to be other firms that are going to be interested in larger. I know, I know many people that are buying that wouldn't touch anything under 750,000 in EBITDA. Um, you know, so there's, there's the buyer for everything. I, the smaller ones tend to be a lower value. So to me, it's maybe a little more bargain hunting. Um, but I can finance those, uh, without, you know, more creative terms. And, and so the bigger you get, the, the higher the valuation typically of any business. The other thing I'm looking for is what does the owner's day-to-day role look like and how much of the actual work is the owner doing? Mm. Um, so, you know, you could have a scenario where it's a one or two person show and the owner's putting in 80 hours a week and but it shows maybe on paper 70% margins. But is that as attractive as a firm where the owner is maybe doing five to 10 hours a week with 30% margins? because they are outsourcing more of, of the work and the tasks, be it the client facing or be it behind the scenes. Um, you know, I also know that many of us buyers are going to look to see how entwined the owner is, mm. you know, how client facing are they? Many cases owners are doing sales and business development. That's the last thing to give up. And so if you take that person out of the mix, you may very well be able to support the client base, but it's not growing, especially if it's in a location you're not in. These are still very location specific businesses, despite the fact that we can work with people anywhere around the world. I have lost acquired clients due to the fact that I'm not right in their backyard. Uh, and it's got nothing to do with you know our inability to do a Zoom or even hop in the car. It's just, you're not here, someone else is. Um, client concentration is a big one. And, and I see that in, in deal sizes, you know, up into the multi-millions. You know, um, I don't like to see client concentration. I know other buyers do not. I know uh, for lenders that would be lending on these deals, client concentration. And that might mean, for me, it starts to be a red flag if any one client makes up, you know, 20% or more of the gross revenue or the top five make up 40 50%. Uh, which you surprisingly i see that a lot i i mean i see i saw one this week where one client was making up half Mm -hmm. and we're talking seven figures of of revenue now there's ways to structure a deal to do that and and the using an earnout one where it's a variable payout over time uh, is a great vehicle to protect and mitigate the risk on the buy side so it's not that those companies don't have value it's just it's it's a yellow flag. It's something that has to be talked about. Uh, and if we were trying to look at all things equal, we'd want a very diversified revenue stream, not coming from any one or two clients. We want the owner to be as removed as possible so that, or, or replaceable, sure. I guess is, is the right term for that. Um, and in terms of growth, we'd like to see fairly steady moving up. And in a perfect world, we'd like to see new business coming in the door separate of the owner's efforts. So that could be inbound from a great web presence. It could be the salespeople on staff that are are out there hunting. You don't typically see that with smaller firms. Uh, In fact, some bigger ones, you don't even see it. But uh, in a perfect world, those would be the the things that I think would be most attractive to most buyers and a high percentage of recurring revenue and recurring, true recurring, not to be confused with repeat. Sure. Sure. Uh, and you know, things like hosting are very sticky, very stable. You get into things like SEO, social media management, they can be recurring, but you want to look at the churn retention on those plans. You know, it's one thing for a $50 a month hosting package to be recurring for five, six years. Are you doing that with a, you know, $3,000 a month retainer? Uh, if you are great, you're doing something right. Uh, but, you know, if, if the churn is, you know, average client is three or four months, I don't know if I'd call that the same level of recurring yeah, myself. Yeah, it's harder to get your return on that. Right. So, yeah, so that's it's pretty interesting to hear, uh, you know, the, the amount of owner involvement as being such a big factor, which makes total sense when you explain it. But I think about a lot of the people I know inside this community, myself included, uh, that might slap like a, an agency name on your business. But really, if I... If I tomorrow left the business, there's no business left. Like th- the whole thing shuts down. And obviously that's that's not an attractive thing for a buyer if 
you know, you, you pr pretty much have to take over everything. Uh, there's no systems for that, those kinds of things in place. And it's hard to replace a human being that people already have connections with. I, I equate that, you know, I think of under industries like perhaps the person that cuts your hair or your doctor or your financial advisor. I mean, these are other personal relationship businesses. And if, you know, many of us maybe have had, you know, the letter comes in, the doctor is no longer there, and then so-and-so takes over. Well, you don't know who they are. And if you've liked your doctor or you liked your financial advisor and now someone else just took over your account, you don't feel any loyalty or ownership, you know, to them. And you, you might hear them out. You might give them a shot, but you might use that as a chance to look around. And that's that's what happens here. Um, and, it, it you know, it's it's just a fact. It's just... You know, most of us don't do anything that, you know, hundreds of other people don't do. Sure. And so it's, um, it's, it's usually people hire us for us. Um, and once we're not there, someone else is, and I may do better work at a lower price and I may, you know, be a nicer looking guy than you, but it, that doesn't matter if someone else liked you and that's what they were used to, you, uh, you've got a transition there that you know, you don't really don't know how that's going to play out and that's right. fine. That's, that's how it is. Um, again, terms and things can structure that to make that work. But if you're trying to build value, it is removing yourself from that. Um, now granted, whoever's client facing doesn't guarantee they'll stay either. So when you have sure. employees, uh, geography is a factor, um, you know, what's your culture of your company. Now we have a lot of people running remote teams even even pre-COVID, but certainly now that Zoom is a household name, um, our industry is a, a very early adopter in working remote and running remote teams, not only remote people that are local and stateside, but remote global. And those are very attractive because now an owner would not be, or a buyer wouldn't be restricted by geography. If you're in Texas, I'm up here in New England, uh, but your team is all remote. I dial in a Zoom or whatever I'm from, it doesn't matter. I'm sure. on the same same footprint. But if you guys are having morning team huddles over coffee and bagels, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm buying and I'm not local, I can't become part of that culture and build a rapport with a team quite as easily. So uh, your your buyer pool becomes much more limited to your local. You know, you've got to sell to someone else who's right there. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense. Uh, so. So what would you say are some of the big red flags or warning signs or deal breakers when you look at an agency? Maybe somebody receives your letter, calls you back, you have that initial conversation. What are some of the things you might hear that are just, you know, you're out of this conversation right away? It's going to be those people that start out and say, this is what I want. Mm. You know, I'm not selling for a dime less than this before I even know what they have. It sort of sets that tone that they're all about the money and you know, I don't really want to sell, but if you were to throw a bunch of money at me, well, maybe I would. And, yeah. and how about everybody would say that, you know, right. Everyone, everyone has their price, but it's usually unrealistic. And I have to think about this through the lens of an investor as well. If I'm going to invest, you know, never mind my time, but my money into something, you know, I can get 10% in the stock market pretty regularly and pretty easily. So, and I'm taking a lot more risk buying a, a company. And so, you know, my return on that needs to be considerably higher. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's based on a multiple of, of your profit. And the higher that multiple, the lower your return. And that's the case for anyone. So I think the other side has to be, for me, motivated. So that's, as I said earlier, I look to unpack that fairly early on. I like to get on a phone call like we did and, and chat. And I, I'm a believer in building the rapport and the trust, but also managing my time to sort of unpack why would why now? Timing is is the number one key for this. You know why why are you reaching out? Why are we having this conversation? Um, many times people are curious. Uh, you know, a cratering company. I, I like to think everything has value. If there is positive cash flow there, there's value to to me. It's just is that value going to be enough to excite the person because there's a point by which the value may be low that they're like, well, I'll make more money just running this thing into the ground or just, you know, putting on autopilot. Many people that lose their passion will take their foot off the gas and they certainly, it takes passion and drive to go out and sell new business. And so 
if you've lost that spark or you've got interested in something else, you'll you'll take your foot off the gas and your business will naturally slow down and that'll show up in your year over year revenue. Doesn't mean it's bad. It might be the right time to have this conversation um, because if you're really experiencing high growth, you probably aren't thinking that way either because you are driving that growth and you're doing it because you love it or it's just growing and you want to see where it goes. Uh, so that's, you know, the red flags definitely come down to, you know, the, again, it, it's just how how big that gap could be between me and the other side, you know, and if I perceive that gap to be a cliff, you know, a total long shot there, then, you know, it's probably just not the right time. And you just try to plant the seed. As I told in the story earlier, sometimes we have a chance to decide when we sell other time life decides for us. Sure. And so you'd like to hope those things don't happen to people, but if it were to, you want to come, I want to come at it as a problem solver. I'm here to help provide you with a resolution or, or take you to the next chapter if that's what you want to do. But I can't make you do it. I can't decide. I can see what you have. I can tell you how it might be worth for me and how I could make it easy to transition. But if that doesn't work for you, then, then it's not for you. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely see that first point of the why now and does this conversation even make sense? Obviously, that's a the huge hurdle you got to get over. Um, what I was thinking of, you know, to dig a little bit deeper into the red flags things, what about like operationally, procedurally, structurally? What are some of those things? I know you talked about, obviously, if the owner's pretty much everything in the business, that's going to be a red flag that it's going to be, you know, probably not the best acquisition or some other things uh, kind of lumped into that that you might see and say, okay, well, I need to take an extra look at this. Yes. I mean, they're all going into the matrix, if you will. And again, none of them necessarily have to be deal breakers, but uh, when you get into looking at profit and loss statements, um, obviously you see sometimes a lot of personal funds and personal expenses flowing through the business. Mm. Uh, I remember looking at one where there was a lot of travel and meals and expense and, and home expenses flowing through it. Very typically when I buy these, I'm doing what's called an asset sale. So I'm not taking over their entity. So you basically create yourself a new LLC or a new legal entity and you're acquiring the assets, moving those over. So I don't necessarily take their liabilities on. And so their P&L and all those, you know, if they're cheating the tax man, that's that's on them. I mean, that's not what I'm buying, but you're going to base your valuation on the true revenue. So, um, you know, which it only hurts them, actually, in those cases. So you're looking, you know, but you're also then thinking if this is a person who's kind of maybe cooking their books, where else may there be some shortcuts? Um, and you, you want to really try to unearth if you can, client relationships, team member relationships, are there employ are there contracts? Not usually. Um, as I said, client concentration is a red flag. Just the overall sloppiness of the business, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when I see a P and L, very often you'll see all the income on one light on called services. You know, all right, fine, but let's. How can we? How, do you know what is recurring? Do you know? I'm not saying my purchase per, uh, profit and loss is perfect either, but I I've, know that I've broken it down by service and my expenses are kind of match up with that. And, you know, where are you paying yourself? Are you, are you just taking the profits? Are you taking a, a salary? You know, are you, you have a lot. Also, you sometimes see a lot of independent contractors that look like employees. And I think if you were to run that by the IRS and pass their sniffer test, these people are W-2s, but a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of agencies I see are running them as freelancers and 1099s. And if you're getting away with it, fine. But if I take that model over, you know, am I going to have to put them on, you know, and then how does that work? So there's, because if I'm not in state, now I'm taking on employees. I, I don't know. I, my personal preference would be to take employees perhaps and move them to contractors during that dating phase because you – you may have your own resources and you may have some overlap and just like with clients, you've got to build that new relationship with the team members. Sure. And no, um, I, not many people, not many employees feel good when they hear that their company's being sold and there's a new no, owner coming in. That's not no, usually an exciting day. No, they're worried about their, their security. Um, and at the end of the day, any of our businesses, our assets could walk right out the door at five o'clock. 
team members and clients. And so there's nothing left at that but a nice shiny logo. So that is the, the risk that has to get mitigated. And, I, you know, I can't think of any, you know, other really major red flags. I mean, th these things all sort of add up if you've got sloppy books, sloppy business, and a sort of cagey owner on the conversation, you know, you're, you're having trouble establishing trust there. Sure. Um, you, you can, you can ask for tax returns and, and to see, you know, what are they claiming if you really want to dig in the numbers, but they're still, they don't, you don't know where the bodies are buried. I took over a batch of clients despite our agreement saying everything was PCI compliant credit card data just flowing through in open forms like it was uh, circa 2001. Uh, and so try explaining that to a, a new client relationship to say, this is wrong. It's against our terms. It's putting you in a risky situation. Well, the last guy said it was fine. I'm telling you it isn't. And so either you're going to fix it or you're not going to stay with us. Uh, you know, that doesn't go over too well. So some of those things you just won't find out until after. So you you know, would that have been a red flag? I don't know. Not probably a deal killer, but something we would have brought to the top of the list to address. Sure. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of this goes back, you know, the examples you used are kind of business acumen, right? And I think a lot of people that because this, this biz, getting into this industry requires like an internet connection and a computer, and that's pretty much all the qualifications you need. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that do it with no business experience. And I'm not saying you can't do it that way or you're wrong if you do come into it that way, but chances are if you don't have business acumen, if you don't have schooling on business, if you hadn't been involved in business before, you're more likely to have sloppy books and poor accounting right. and all these things that kind of add up. Um, add up to those things that might be red flags as your firm gets bigger typically speaking you've got more revenue to work with you get a little more serious a little more uh, competent in, in business acumen and you may then have the budget to bring in a bookkeeper uh, you may and you may choose to do that and, and they get things in order you may start to write um, a company policy manual and have documented processes in places which just it's not typical for smaller companies at a certain size and that's totally normal and that's all right. It just, you just have to be realistic that that impacts your value. And if you, you, you were to create a project, I mean, a, a company SOP manual so that a, you know, a monkey could run your business. If I bought your business and I never had to ask you a single question post acquisition because it was all right here, that would be a job well done. Yeah. Uh, and all your client files were documented and everything was all organized, but that's just not the case because that's not what makes us money. We, <laughs> we're out doing the work or selling and that's totally normal. And so I, I'm not saying anyone should go and do that. That only starts to happen as you get bigger and you're able to delegate roles and either someone else in your world starts to work on that or, or you have the time to do it. Um, and, and, you know, and again, I think you will also see a large variety of buyers. So depending on where you are in that cycle, uh, there are brokers who will take your business and market it and tell it's worth, tell you it's worth probably sometimes more than it is. And they'll, they'll take a 10, 15% commission to do that. I don't have anything against brokers, but the ones I've bought have all been without brokers. It's easier to build the rapport when you're sending a letter to a guy and you're talking to him or her. Um, and there are there are strategic buyers, people like me that are already in this industry looking to grow and bolt on acquisitions, either acquire talent or clients or, you know, a penetration in, in a vertical. And there's also going to be people that are leaving corporate America looking for a chance to get into the self-employed world mm -hmm. and maybe had, have experience in web development or any of these specialties through, um, you know, being an employee somewhere that are looking to buy. So everyone's got different motivations and that's going to affect the value in terms of how that may be. I don't ever say that I would be the guy who's going to pay the most. Sure. I don't want to be. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Someone else can do that. Um, but just because it doesn't fit one person's criteria doesn't mean it isn't a match for someone else. Yeah, for sure.
So I, I think what would be most helpful, we do have some questions coming in and I made a few uh, list of questions, uh, maybe more quick hitty type questions for us to save for, for the end of this. But I think one of the things that was going to be most helpful for people in this conversation is what are the, and I think we've already touched on a lot of these, honestly, but what are, what are the things we should be thinking about now? What are the things we should be actioning now? If we do think that one day we want to be in the position where our agency is sellable, is attractive to buyers. So if there were, you know, two or three things that you think are really, um, the best return on investment of your time, what, what would those, that advice be to agencies? The, the first one would be looking at what you do day to day and then keeping in the back of your mind, is there someone else already in my world that could do this? Or, you know, the, the litmus test that you shared is if I went on vacation, how long could I go before my business stopped working? Having some thought around that and starting to take, okay, here's something that I've been doing. Maybe this person can do it, or maybe I can find someone to do this. And just, it, it's, you should never feel guilty about doing less, I think. Uh, because that's going to increase your value. And also, while you still own the business, I think that's a huge win because it's going to free you up to work on the business versus in it. Um, and, you know, one of the first things that I think most agency owners should be giving up is the actual deliverables because that's very easy to find someone else to do. You may still be account managing, but getting the deliverable work off your plate is a, is a big one. Otherwise, you just own your job. It's really not a business. You just own a self-employed freelance gig, and that, that's nothing wrong with that. Um, and the second big thing to look at, I would say, is be very mindful of that client concentration. If you land that big fish and you're, you know, typically you're going to give them more attention because they're a huge chunk of your revenue, know that that's risky for you as long as you own it as well as for a potential buyer. So if, if things start, it's sort of like rebalancing your your retirement portfolio if it gets a little out of whack try to focus on bringing some more clients in to balance that off um, just in case that company goes because that, that's not going to be good for you as an owner either um, into having all your eggs in that one basket so i think those are the two things that i think not only can help your business become more valuable but also make it stronger and and make your quality of life better for as long as you own it yeah, and that, that's one thing we kind of touched on before we started this live call is, you know, a lot of these things that you might want to do uh, in, in the frame of reference of us, of, of our conversation today in selling your agency are just going to be things that would probably make your agency run better. Like if you're uh, doing a better job with your books and if you have processes in place and if you're taking yourself out of the day-to-day -day operations, a lot of those things are not only attractive, more attractive to buyers, but a lot of those things are probably going to make your business run smooth too. Um, Absolutely. So, so um, I, I did see a few questions come in through here. We might do these a little bit more rapid pace and we'll see what we can get through. If anybody has any questions that have uh, crept up and you've been holding on to them, go ahead and drop them into the comments. Um, Jessica did say Link totally has a, 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 excuse me, Link totally has a radio voice. And that was followed up by Benjamin saying Kyle totally has a radio face. So I want to thank you for that because that was uh, the joke of the day for sure. Um, I've heard that many times, uh, and I, I take that as a as a as a good thing. Maybe not a face for TV, but I have been I hear it a lot. So yeah, I, I, I I could hear you announcing like the sports game on the radio, like the baseball game or something. I could hear that. That'd be fun. Yeah, sign them up. All right. So uh, my number one question was, how is the value of an agency typically determined? And I know that's probably a deep question, but uh, generally speaking. Good question. And, and for most businesses, an agency is no different. It's it's going to be based on a multiple of uh, of what I call, you know, SDE or seller discretionary earnings, which, you know, in layman's terms, I think equals profit, right? The money that's left over before you pay taxes. And for many small businesses, that's just really what's in the checking account, right? Uh, a multiple of that anywhere typically, in, you know, from say on average two to three times. And this would be for small businesses with that number being, you know, half a million or less. Larger agencies, half a million, six, 700, a uh, thousand or more is becomes a multiple of what's called EBITDA, which is really just that number backing out the owner's salary. So that may be more in the three to five range. Um, and so that's a real quick way to just get a ballpark 
you know, if you've got an agency that's, you know, if you're making a hundred thousand dollars in profit again, after the bills are paid and, and let's, let's add back in any non-essential business things like the car, the meals and whatever you're paying. So if that's a true number, you know, that business in my mind, realistically could be worth between two and 300,000. Okay. Yeah. That's, Again, all things being equal, there's sure. certainly outliers above and below that, but yeah, I, I I'm think, sure you go deeper into that. You don't throw out that number on the first call, I'm sure. But no, I think that gives you shoot yourself idea. in the foot. Yeah. Um, well, we just, just we a, just had Michael commented and said if you could give us some an example using actual figures, for example, an agency with five five hundred thousand in recurring and five hundred thousand in project work. I think obviously the numbers are a lot bigger than the example yeah, you just gave. Be and, and I, you know, one of the sources I look at is there's a website called bizbysell.com where a lot of businesses across all industries are for sale. They actually publish what multiples things sell for. And there is one for internet companies, which tends to hover around the two, two and a half times. So I, I assume that's based on previous sales. So I feel like that's at least one indicator that there, there's a, you'll have no trouble finding people that will tell you it's worth far more than that. And if you, if you're in SaaS or you've got an app or something a little stickier, that's a, a different conversation. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share resources with anyone offline or, or you post it. There's, I try to find as much as I can because you, you, you want to have some evidence to back up, not just what I'm saying, but where did I get this from? Sure. Um, yeah. And actually one of the, one of the guys in our group, uh, he owned an agency in Chicago and sold it several years back. And we had a similar conversation about, uh, you know, he sold one agency, you've bought multiple agencies. So the conversations are a little bit different, but when he talked about that experience, I think the biz by sell was what he used, uh, through, through the sale of his company. So I know that's been a resource we've shared before. Um, so another question, do, do you usually, and this probably depends on the buyer, but we'll just ask you since we have you here, uh, do you usually have the previous owners stick around for a period of time or is it a pretty clean break once the deal is done? I personally prefer a clean break because I feel like if we're going through all this work and this person's looking to exit, I, I want to help them with that. I mean, they're moving on to whatever the next step is. I don't want them to be feeling like they have to stick around. And something changes in the mind of a person when they go from being the owner to now an employee. I mean, they, they mentally have moved on and they closed on that deal things can go south and it yeah. also makes it hard for the new owner to build the rapport with the clients and the team if the previous person is still around. So I personally like to just have them sort of on call for that transition period, which may last 30, 60, 90 days, just to be on call to help redirect clients, to reassure them to kind of still have their face out there. So the clients feel that reassurement, but I don't really want them to have to do any work you know, post closing. Otherwise, if that's what they want to do, they should stay in the business. I mean, I, I think you will see larger agencies where an owner may stay on and they call it like a accu hire, you know, buy the company, keep the person, the smaller ones, there's not enough money to do that anyway. You know, right. if, if you had that agency making a hundred thousand and I bought it from you based on that hundred thousand coming my way, what do I pay you with? Yeah. You know, you the person selling is going to want their same salary of a hundred thousand, right. which Correct. is not going to be reasonable. If you're buying a million, an agency that makes two million a year, and it's based on EBITDA, then the owner's CEO salary is already taken out. You're going to fill that role either with yourself or someone else. So then those conversations make more sense of keeping that person in there to run things, because now you're coming at it more as an investor buying it through an investor's point of mind versus where I'm at is I'm, you know, buying it to run it sure. per se. So um, there's usually not enough meat in the bone to do that, even if you wanted to. So what about, um, how does this work? Let's say somebody wants to sell their agency because they've moved on to different kinds of clients, kind of the example we used of niching or finding a different space within the industry. It, are there, uh, is it common to have like no compete clauses? So when you leave, leave the company, you can't, Obviously, they, you probably don't want them reaching out to their exact client list, but going out and acquiring new um, new customers in the field, starting fresh, is that a problem? It's all negotiable. Um, I know for me, I've put non-competes in there, and they, there's some question to how enforceable those are. I mean, you could certainly drill it down by, you know, if, if uh, 
you know, if I'm in Boston, uh, you know, there's a non-compete within, you know, a hundred mile radius or something. Can't, I can't really stop you from moving to California to start up an agency in, in that case. But because what we do is, is global, I personally would like to understand why the heck you want to get back in. I mean, just keep what you have. I'm really looking for you to be done with this. And so maybe not for life, but I'd like that non-compete to be long enough for whatever my earnout is so that I can build the relationship after that. You know, I can't tell you not to do it for the rest of your life, but sure. for a few years time and definitely, you know, I don't want you knocking on the door of the people I've just purchased from you. So if you were, if you were, like you said, if it was a spin out and you're still going to be in the industry, then I can't really have you do a non-compete, but I definitely would say, here's the clients I'm buying from you. You, you can't go after these guys. Sure. You know, you can't sell them to me and then take them back um, for at least a period of time. Wouldn't that be um, a racket? You know, I have, I have taken some where they have been a couple that's such a pain in the butt. I sent them back. And so if I'm deciding that fine, um, you know, that's my decision, but um, you can't, you can't go do that no matter sure. what they, you know, and, and you have to, that's where I found out, you know, you, a good lawyer, you know, get, even having it in writing, you've got to know that you can enforce this and, and you can't, the client really can go where they want. So, you know, you'd have to, you know, I guess you could look up the DNS and see if they went back, but then what are you going to do? Right. You can't drag them back. Right. You know, you could just have uh, I've had clauses in, in my agreements that if clients leave, because what you don't know is when you're taking it over, if there may be some clients that already have a foot out the door and you'll never know that, but it, it, especially if the business has been slowing down, clients sometimes pick up on that and, and are secretly, you know, planning the next step already. Um, and that comes out in the wash fairly quickly. Um, nothing you can do, but it's just, again, part of that, that mitigation. All right. So uh, I have one more and then we have quite a few coming in here. So uh, this one's kind of from uh, somebody made the joke that your inbox is going to be flooded with uh, offers once this uh, call is over. Uh, but let's say we are going out and we've decided we want to look at selling our business. What should we as agencies be looking for in a buyer? Um, is, is there certain... I'm sure there's scandalous people just like there are in every industry. So what do you think are the qualities of somebody that would be a good fit to be a buyer? I think if I were to sell, I would, I'd be looking for someone who's got the highest likelihood to close the deal. So depending on what my terms are, I mean, obviously I would want to get as much upfront. I mean, it's a risk shift, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm trying to, in a perfect world, I'd want someone to just write me one check for the whole thing and, and there we go, we're done. That's not how it happens usually, to my knowledge. So I'm trying to assess this person's capacity to make good on, if they're gonna pay me over time, you know, I would probably wanna know their credit score, their, you know, what they're like. I mean, I wanna know their fiscal well-being. I'd look for some references to their ability. I'd also wanna assess their capacity to do they know what I know? Can they step into my role? What's their professional background? If they aren't from our industry, what skill sets do they have that could translate? And how, again, it comes back to how owner removed is my business? I mean, if my business is running on autopilot, then I'm much more confident that they won't mess that up and they could step right into it. But if I have, you know, the keys up here in my head and I haven't documented them and they don't know, you know, C panel from, WordPress, uh, I'm going to be more concerned about their ability to do that. And just because they have a willingness to do a deal and maybe even the appearance of having the financial resources, how do I feel about that with my clients you know, or my team members, as well as my own fiscal situation? So it's a, definitely a two-way street. And that risk in the deal is shifted from side to side. And both parties ideally are sharing some risk there but the more comfortable you are with the person in terms of their ability and just just the likability right do you do you believe them do you feel yeah. good about them you know are you friendly with them I mean, would you go have a burger and a beer after all this um, yeah i know when, uh, when i spoke with hans uh when he sold his agency that was a big deciding factor he had i think multiple people interested but one of the big deciding factors for him was the company he sold it to felt like the right people to sell it to like from just that you know, instinctual is, level. I would, I personally would get on a plane to go meet someone before a deal and, and, um, 
just you, you got to feel comfortable however long that takes uh, i think and so it's not necessarily a fixed checklist but i would i wouldn't just assume anything about a person's sure. capacity i'd verify that just like you would anything else google them and ask questions get references if you know in my case i've offered up people that i've bought from before that i'm happy to make introductions to you know did he pay on time did he do what he said he did did you have to take him to court uh yeah you know i mean you know all these things that you may not think to ask you should yeah no doubt and some of those things you listed off right now are things i wouldn't have thought to ask uh, had our conversation gone further i don't think i would have asked for your credit score uh so that's good to think no about. one has um but i think it's fair if you're if you're financing the deal in terms of an earn out or seller financing, sure. uh, you know, asking something along those lines is, is this person, you know, got the means to do this and, and pay me. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let me get to some of these questions we have. We have about uh, five or six minutes left here in this call. Uh, I want to get to these questions here. So I think we touched on this a little bit, but Hans is in here and he asked, um, are you looking at an agency's like standard operating procedures? Is that part of your decision making if they have some good SOPs in place? It's a plus, but it's certainly the, the size I'm looking at. I'm not expecting it. I seldom see it uh, any more than I see a written business plan or marketing plan. So if, if those things are there for me, it's definitely a bonus and it, it more speaks to the, the, the owner's um, ability. You know, they're just a little more organized there, but it's certainly not a requirement. Yeah, I think that's something we see in our group all the time. Something people are still saying they need to get done. So you're not alone, is is what I'm hearing. Most agencies and I, don't and have I, those I'm things in place. I'm not going to get an A plus on that for my business either. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I, me either. Um, <laughs> uh, what about um, as far as if the company you're looking at buying, if they have a team, but the team's all offshore, is that a good thing, a bad thing, an indifferent thing? It's it's totally indifferent to me. If if anything, it's a bit of a plus because I've personally have always used global talent i mean people need to work no matter where they are and uh, so for me i don't see that as a detriment you know maybe some buyers prefer to have people onshore um there, there's limiting beliefs still floating around mm -hmm. out there but uh, i don't have them yeah personally we, we have a global community here so yeah um, i think that'll fly with everybody all right so this is a really interesting one uh, i think mark was the first one to ask this. He said, do you integrate the acquisition into your business or do you let it continue to run under the original business's name? Great question. And historically, I have acquired primarily client lists where it made sense to roll them in to my existing business because there really wasn't any brand or any infrastructure worth keeping. And in a case like a spinoff, right? There's, you're not getting a company, you're just getting some clients. So you've got to put them somewhere. I think if there was a good business case to keep the existing agency in place, either based on geography, the brand, then that makes sense to do that. And it can just be a DBA under the parent company. I mean, there's ways to do that. So sure. I look at it as a case by case basis. I don't want to jeopardize the acquiring business, but obviously there are some advantages to reducing duplicate costs and things. Um, but that's something you could always roll in and merge down the road too. It doesn't necessarily have to be day one. Um, and that may also, if you're acquiring from someone, may help them feel a little more comfortable about that transition period that you're not just, you know, crossing the name off the sign on day one. Um, in, in case they ever had to take something back from a non-performance, if you're not butchering it right away, that, that would certainly, I know, would help me if I was in that side. So it's, it's case by case. Sure. Yeah. And I think brand equity is something kind of hard to measure in our spaces, especially there's just probably the smaller not size. Yeah. yeah. You get bigger, that becomes, you know, if I was acquiring a company much larger than me, it wouldn't make sense for me to try to squeeze it into right. me. So what about, uh, what about actual like locations or physical spaces? How does that factor into the equation if people have an, a, a big office with all their team there on location and all that? That definitely makes it a harder conversation for me if I'm not able to be there, and, and you know it's not scalable for me to relocate, relocate. I mean, I could again, it's sort of a case by case situation. But if there was no way of changing that, not only is that expensive, but it's also again limiting you to a local buyer or someone who's going to relocate. I'd really want to see, you know, can that team run it on its own? 
is there a layer of management? Is there a general manager in place? Someone other than the owner who is going to be there that, you know, could that work? Uh, now, after the pandemic, a lot of people have had a, at least a taste of completely remote, even Freedom. if you are Freedom, around. You and some agencies are shifting to that. So I guess I would really look, could I shift to that? How does that look? And that's a very candid conversation with the owner is, is could we move to that in time? Where do people feel with that? And if you lose a few, it's not the end of the world, but you want your core team to be able to do that. And then maybe shift to a co-working space model or something. Um, if ever there was a time for that conversation, now is a lot easier to have that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm in the Northeast, so, you know, I've got young family, kids. I mean, you know. A downtown to... Granbury, Texas location would not help you out a whole lot. It'd be hard. I mean, granted, somewhere to go on a business trip where it's warmer. That's you true. Know, and, I'm I'm cool with that, but to pack up everybody and the dog and the in the station wagon, you know. So if you're if then, you're gonna get a physical location, get it somewhere near a beach. That's know? right. So that's it's a right. little bit more attractive for the buyer to use that as vacation. <laughs> so that makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, perfect. Well, Link, I really really appreciate this. This was a really interesting conversation. I think you shared tons of uh, things that people likely w I know myself would have never thought of. So uh, hopefully that's helpful to people thinking about these things down the line. And and I think your your point to you know are are you building the business or are you you know do you own a job? And that's something that's talked about in in the E Myth mm -hmm. uh, and something that really struck me when I read that as well. Um, I'm the kind of person that probably if I'm a hundred percent honest uh, is you know, building a job for myself and I'm okay with that. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, if uh, there are a lot of people in this group that are working on building teams, working on scaling, uh, you know, really looking into the future of this business and how they scale it. And I think having conversations like this now is going to be a whole lot more helpful than having to scramble and try to get all this done yes. uh, when the time comes. And like you said, yep. the time may come when you plan it or the time uh, may come suddenly when you didn't have it in mind. So it's good to be planning these things now. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, just because you're owning your job doesn't mean it, 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 you know, we're unique that we can sell our job. And so it doesn't mean that it doesn't have value, certainly. And you could build a very big one person business, uh, I think, in this space. And that's that's really cool. And that has value. Absolutely. I don't want to suggest you've got to have, uh, you know, for some people that may have more value because it makes it very portable yeah. and and geographically agnostic. Uh, indeed. But uh, yeah, this has been great. I, I could talk all day and I'd be happy to be a resource again here or, or um, you know, if you drop my contact info, I'm happy to talk to anyone offline. And I I run into other buyers. I, I mean, I've kept the list of agents. So I, I've been doing this a long time. And so I sometimes can play matchmaker if it's not a fit for me and just happy to have a conversation with anyone offline to be a resource. Here's where I found this. And because it, it, it is hard to find the answers to this stuff. And I'm kind of making some up as I go, uh, just because it's, it's go find me a book, right? On agency sailing on a smaller scale. I, it's, I don't think it's been written yet. Well, there's your next task. It could be. Could there's be. your next task. Well, perfect. Well, uh, Link did join our group, so you can tag him in there, and I'll make sure to uh, get the contact information he wants me to share, and I'll post it along with this replay on our website uh, so y'all can reach out to him if you need to. Again, thank you so much, Link. I really appreciate this. We're getting a bunch of comments in here uh, thanking you for joining us and saying what a great conversation that, with, that this was. So, again, I, I appreciate it and uh, you taking your time today and doing this for us. And hopefully we'll, we'll do it again when you've – uh, done a nice acquisition of somebody in of our community and we can have both sides and and hear both sides of the story that would that'd be, be fun that'd be fun absolutely all well, right guys you, well Kyle, thank you so much for joining it. us today and we will catch you on the next one bye-bye you got it